Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is a particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Sarah Griffiths. Rob H, Ben White, Maximum Gravy, Austin Whitsitt, John Ketties, Tommy Swagnets, Michael Kahn, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuker, Bose Nail, Sampson, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Dal West Watson, Mike, Muted, Dick Earth Skeptic, Maria Nealands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, TheFlatEarthChannel.com, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. To make room for Discord. Nathan. Hello. Are you recording at the minute? I'm always recording. I had to send my amp back. I was, or I've, I've boxed up uh, my amp. Uh, Not that you can. I was going to say something to you. <laughs> obviously more important stuff to talk about. I was going to say something to... Uh, Speeding Warrior. Here you go. Right. Remember that conversation we had before? Give it a couple the, of minutes, the... right, just because you can get interrupted by bingy bongs for, for at least another 60 seconds, probably. It's really small. It's not going to be like a big whatever. It's really simple. And I don't know, I'm quite enjoying we listening to Anthony about... chewing his cornflakes and scraping his bowl. It's just beautiful, beautiful sounds. <laughs> Sound like a fucking mum. <laughs> All right, I'll wait. I have to admit, that is the most annoying thing, listening to somebody eat. It drives me insane. Yeah, eating well, the noise of mastication is terrible. It's horrible noise. It's We got busy days, right? So if you can cram eating and having a discussion with somebody... Yeah, yeah. No, why not? Just let, him finish, <laughs> just let him finish eating. And I'll moan about my amp, which is now not working. Or not, not working, it's not connected because it's in a box about to be picked up by UPS and sent back to the guy again for the exact same fault again. There we go. Well, that's, I can't. that's irritating. And <laughs> I'm nearly there. <laughs> I sent an email off to Optoma yesterday, or the day before yesterday, I forget when, Monday or Tuesday. And I was like, what's going on with this repair? I've got to chase it up eventually, as much as I'm scared of what the amount will be. Um, and... Uh, Today, while I was in a class, I got a phone call from Cheltenham, which is where my dealer is. Please mute, Anthony. I'm sick of hearing your bowl. Please. Thank you if you've pressed the button. Probably not. But yeah, so he phoned me and I tried to get him back and he just didn't answer his call. So I'm expecting to find out exactly how much the projector is going to cost on the same day I'm shipping out the amp, which is just, I don't know. It seems like a never-ending story of constant maintenance with equipment around here. I mean, that's life, right? And sometimes I forget how long the shows run for. But there we go. I'm done moaning. Yeah, All right, was... you know what? Well, <laughs> go on, Tent. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, Tent. Hello, I was just gonna... I'm just going to talk to this while Anthony's on mute because I'm just going to get it out and then he can answer when he's on eating. How do I put it? Remember how when I had that chat with Anthony and I said, okay, we got to consider this and move on, move on forward from this point. And then that's kind of it. I was like, okay, well, um, that was interesting what Anthony showed. And I kind of didn't think about it too much. But then that one day I had, we had a conversation, I guess what started that whole hexafluoride tinfoil boat thing. Adam said something key. 
he because I thought we were changing. Oh, what was it? How did Adam do it? Because he put something very in perspective. We were changing the density instead of changing the downward bias. That's basically what he brought to my realization. And this is thanks to Adam. That's why I'm bringing it up. So I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, this is kind of like with the egg thing. Like the thing we're looking after is what's giving the 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 bias for the what density. downward bias. Yeah. Hold on a finish. second. Hold on a second. Let him finish. He's new there. He's just finding his words. Can't you tell? Right. We're looking for what is affecting the direction, right? Why the densest things go in one direction, not the other directions. But with the egg thing, we're actually just manipulating the density, not the direction. So, oh, wait a second. My kettle is... There we go. So basically, the premise of... Uh, that experiment is not the same. Adding electricity to water, we're like expecting it to be a density change, right? Like we're adding salt in there, that's changing the density. But adding electricity is not the same as, if if that's our presumed cause, then it needs to be something that affects direction, not affects density. That's kind of all what I wanted to say. Did I come out clear? Remember what I was testing though? I was testing, when your words were, Maybe there's something else that I didn't control that I should have controlled. And you said you're you right. were, You said something like um, maybe get the egg back to the floating in the middle. And then you said words to the effect of pass a current through it or pass electricity through it or something. And, and I think Nathan said after it, um, pass electricity through it. Okay, go science. Go forth in science or words to that effect. And I thought in my head, I had the image straight away. I thought, well, I could do that. So based on what you were describing and how I understood or inter interpreted what you said at the time and how Nathan translated that, my understanding was I can test that, I can go and do that. So I did exactly that. And I had already done it anyway. Um, and I challenged Bob to do it. But now Bob hasn't done it. And you'd said that. I thought, right, now I've got to do it so to show what Bob didn't do because he could have done it but never did. Now, it might be that I misunderstood it, but my understanding was that if the egg's back in that floating position in the middle... And then there was a current there. If that egg would accelerate in any direction at all, if there was any evidence that it was moving, then perhaps there might have been a, a control that needed to be there that I didn't put in. But that was why I was testing it. So when you say we didn't manipulate the direction, there wasn't a, a direction to be manipulated in the first place because there wasn't that that effect from the, the, the electronic flow of currents or amps or whatever that that flow didn't cause a direction to be able to manipulate. So when you said then we didn't manipulate the direction, we manipulated the medium. I was trying to manipulate the direction, but it didn't work as far as I could see. Well, you you heard me right and stuff like that, but my premise was flawed. The way okay. because I thought I thought it was like that too, but then what Adam pointed out to me one time that one day I was like, "Oh my goodness, we're my my premise was flawed." So if so you want to reformulate it, if you want to reformulate it and, and and reconstruct it in a way, I don't mind trying to trying to do the test. I don't mind trying to prove or disprove it either way. But if if you want to reformulate it, I'm up for that. I'm up for the science. I'm up for the evidence that we can demonstrate. And if, if I've got it wrong, that I'm all right with that. But if if, if, we, if it doesn't do the thing that is presented, I'm all right with that too. But I hope it works two ways with the people that say, well, maybe it was the, the coal that should have done it, and then I'd put coal in it and it didn't do it. Then they've got to say, well, maybe coal doesn't do that. Because that's that's what science does. It proves or disproves the cause of the effect. And if, if it disproves the perceived cause, then that's not the cause of the acceleration. So that's why I'm. if you can formulate it in a way, I, I'll try and do what you say. And if I get it wrong, then we can fine tune it. But I'm open for this because I believe that the only thing that's influenced in the direction is the relative density of one against the relative density of the other. I don't believe there's anything more than that. All right. I I agreed with the, some of the stuff that you said, like not with what you think it is, but like, yeah, we should test it out. And if we're just after what's, you know, what's true and all that stuff you said. Yeah, I fully agree with you. I don't mind testing it. If you can formulate it, and if I understand it the way you mean it, and I do it, and then we get a result either way, I'll, I'll try and do it the best I can, because that's what right. science is, right? Right, that's right. Well, um, see, that, that's one thing that's bothering me a bit is 
why are you basing it off something that you don't know righteous like you're you're bringing up this other thing it could be but you don't you don't even have an experiment to make a well, claim exactly to me, to me the observed phenomena is is a concentration of density towards one direction instead of evenly being distributed everywhere right not exactly so the, the phenomena is just an induced vector doesn't even matter which way right. you induce it just a vector now to elaborate some things go up some things go down some things remain neutral that is the vector ascribed to a leaf that falls from a tree hits the water stays there for a bit then falls down through the water or a plant on the bottom of the ocean floor whoever's in discord no it's g plus uh, it's you righteous <laughs> clicking away yeah, sorry my dead man in the kitchen <laughs> I'm, I, on discord i have like a sound suppressor on g plus i yeah I yeah excuses excuses <laughs> <laughs> it's the vector it's phenomena vector all right i'll go with that but you're halfway you there to the next oh done i'll just summarize it because that was a good little back and forth yes and conciliatory on both sides Especially you, righteous. You're like, yeah. Well, it's it's a flawed premise. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so go forth, and you've got your your i uh, your dv your dependent variable that vector to elaborate. Some things go up, some things go down, some things remain neutral. Well, that is your dv. What causes that to occur? So you've just got to say, well, electricity in this case. Fundamentally, I found what Anthony to to, to do in that regard flawed. I'm not going to go into why it's not it's not his place to do it or not do it or do a good job for it. He's already established the cause. This is all beyond fuss. But there we go. For anybody else who's doing it, that's how you do it. You formulate a hypothesis, which is if A, then B. B is the vectors that you're going to induce. doesn't matter if it's up, down, sideways, whatever. A vector induced. Well, you just got to vary something to see if you can induce it. That's it. And then if you're going to be thorough, you have a null. Which is to say, if my independent variable, we're going to say electricity for the simplistic use of this description. If electricity, then vector change. If electricity, no vector change would be the null. That's it. Then electricity, put it in, vary it, see if you can cause a vector change. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Can I just say that um, I could have spent a little bit more time and like made it look, look like give it the, the the I could have formulated it properly. I could have said the I identified the um, alternative hypothesis. I could have I could have identified the null hypothesis and I could have done it properly. But essentially, I just wanted to see did it do what what was suggested or not. Now it might be that there is like a macroscopic midgy stick amount of movement, right? And it was too small to perceive mathematically. That's possible, right? So you could mathematically calculate that it was a tiny, tiny thing. But if we don't see it real world, does, does it really exist just because it appears in the maths? And if we're going to go down that argument, which is what they will do to quantify it, because they'll always use maths to quantify the effect. So they can invoke the effect by just a minuscule amount, right? As long as it exists in the maths, and, and, and you can't deny it, that it exists in the maths because maths works out. It's just a very, very small amount. And then when you say, okay, then it exists in the maths, then they reify that into real world and say, so it exists. And that we say, no, and that's, that's reification, right? You still need to demonstrate that this thing exists. But if it's too small for us to measure, it's too small to call or, or see the effects of, then is it really happening? And that's not my, that's why, that's why I did it a bit rough because I gave a little bit of leeway for somebody to say, Ah, but if you balance a laser beam off the top of it, and if it moves a little tiny bit, it'll deflect the beam. That opens the door for somebody else to refine, not debunk, but refine what I did, just to show that it could be done, and it needs a little bit of work maybe, but that, that's not for me to do, is it? It's for somebody else to do. And maybe they'll do it, maybe they won't, but until they do, they don't prove anything. So it, I did it rough on purpose, really. Well, well now, as far I'll... as moving forward, just let Righteous know how to mute him. Yeah, John. I was just letting Righteous know that I'd have to mute him so he doesn't start talking and not realise he's on mute in the Hangout. Go ahead, John. Well, I was going to say, as moving forward, you'd have to build on knowledge. You can't just say this thing we observed didn't happen. It was this other thing that caused it. Right? So the, the salt that he added that changed the vector of the egg, right? Um, you know, and 
you could build on that possibly you know? but I, I don't see adding something new and claiming that as a causal agent I, I just don't fair enough I mean, as an example, right, uh, they noticed that when people eat fruits on voyages, they didn't get scurvy, right? Well, it wasn't that those oranges uh, were the only thing that would prevent scurvy. It was that vitamin C within that orange, right? So you can build on knowledge, but it's not like they threw out oranges as a way to stop scurvy. You, you understand where I'm yeah, coming exactly. from? That's why I'm open to refinement. If somebody does it a little bit better than what I did and then says, I got a different result or says, I did it better than yours. And I was like, well, what's the effect? Well, it didn't do anything more. So that either way, I'm all right with, because if it, if it progresses the argument and it shows that there might be a correlative factor, I'm all right with that. I just want it. I want, I just don't want, I don't like it when people make claims, show absolutely no consideration of trying to support it with actual evidence and pretending as though it's gospel truth because it misleads people into thinking stuff that's not actually true. Now, I did that test, like I say, I did it like 12 months ago and said to Adam, all it did was start electrolysis, didn't do anything, try and get Bob to do it. And I, he didn't, he never did it. He just ignored it. But it was only when somebody came from that as a spin off and presented it to me, I was like, now I've got to do that to show that it's not true. Um, and if I don't do it, I'm not, like I say, I'm fine with it. Not if, if I didn't do it good enough or to somebody, then go, like Nathan says, go forth and experiment and see if you can get that egg to accelerate. See if there's any other way you can get the egg to uh, accelerate. Like maybe if you, I don't know, if you shone a red light or a blue light and considered that um, the, the um, what was it, Einstein's photoelectric effect might cause an acceleration. If, if that's what your claim is, go and do it. See if it does it. Because it is something we can test, right? And if someone comes up with some fantastic idea, go and test it. But what I, it just bugged me when they, they come up with the idea and then they show no like no desire to try and prove it at all. They just preach it. That pisses me off. So that's why I did it. Because there's a lot of misconception well, you know, about what is and isn't proof. Hence, we end up doing ball busters in a very cyclical manner, going through what the scientific method is and how it provides proof. Because, like I say, some people just don't recognise what science is and what it's useful for and what it'll give them. Now, if they don't recognise that and you say, well, where's your experiment for this? Where's your validated, formulated hypothesis? They're going to go, what? Oh, I want to need that. Here's my story. Here's my apparatus that I'm going to call an experiment if you want that. And it's like, no, no, no. I want to see your validated cause and effect relationship with the null that's been formulated in a proper formal hypothesis. Where's that? Why would I need that? <laughs> it would be the reply you got if they don't recognize the importance of it. I was kind of expecting ballers to take, uh, you know, the beaker and the egg uh, and the liquid solution up to the top of a building and drop it off. <laughs> and then say, see, the egg accelerated. <laughs> that is what they do. You're saying it like it's a metaphor. How is that any different to picking up a mic and dropping it? Exactly. It's not. That's why it's not. That's why I said I was expecting them to start doing that as a way to try to refute Anthony's position. You know, just but they. I mean, they never. I don't think I've ever heard any of them doing it. But I, it would just be funny, is what I was saying. Right. Indeedy. I mean, that is what they chant, though. They often will chant. It's only the people who are in a lot of pain on the anti-flat Earth side that acknowledge have a tacit acknowledgement of our arguments just to hand wave them well it's already been debunked or whatever they say well the other people on the other side you know that would be what they asserted what's that you say you want to establish why the egg went up well it's because everything goes down and you're like what well it's buoyancy isn't it gravity pulls the solution around the egg down pulling the salt down and that forces the egg up and you're like what it was specific to the medium, and when the density was changed, it made it go up. Before that, it was neutral. No, no, no. Gravity was pulling it down, and when you added more to the solution, increased the density, you, you were actually just adding more down. What? More down to make it go up. What? That's how it goes on. Then you go, okay, so you're saying the force of down pulled the liquid down to force on displace the, liquid, uh, the egg up with buoyancy. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. So there's a force... Pulling, then. Yes, that's precisely right. No, there isn't. 
Because that force would be gravity, and it's 107 years out of date. Mass doesn't attract mass. There is no pulling force. Gravity isn't a force. You're like, oh, if they acknowledge that, which they wouldn't at this stage of the game, they won't acknowledge Einstein when it comes to the actual argument. They just want to think of gravity as a force because that's how it's just been described in defence of that buoyancy argument, which requires gravity to force everything, including gas, to go down, go boom, boom. So their explanation is, if it's going up, well, it's because everything's going down with gravity, a force. And it isn't. Well, you know, but that's like uh, in the on the flat earth side of this, uh, the people debating, you know, relative density versus uh, incoherent dielectric acceleration. At least the flat earthers have something they can physically uh, demonstrate. They may have a flawed premise to begin with, you know, but they're not... Uh, calling to some ethereal, uh, uh, you know, you can demonstrate magnetism, you know, you can control and vary how uh, a magnet will work, right? But uh, the ballers will never vary gravity. It just That's never happening. So you're saying they've got no um, observed phenomena in the first instance, because if they say things go down, you can just say, well, no, they don't. There are things that go up. So, no, you know, gas expands in all directions. That violates that law if everything with mass is going towards the centre of the mass of Earth with gravity. But for the fact that it's 107 years out of date, we wouldn't even be talking about it. But they just need a force to reify when there's no explanation other than the density of the medium to explain why things are going up, down. Some things aren't moving at all and remaining neutral. Most things, in fact, find their equilibrium. But... If they're not in equilibrium, they're moving. And if they're not moving, the globo will make them move. And it'll make it move down. <laughs> and ignore the clouds and the helium balloons that go up. Until you why bring it upon it them to say, well, why do those things go down? Well, up, my bad. Why do the balloon or the cloud go up? And they'll go, well, because the gas around it's going down. It's being pulled with gravity, mass, to the centre of Earth. Because it's got mass. Mass attracts mass. Right? So it's all the gas being pulled, de- go down, go boom, boom. <laughs> it's like, well, where, do you, where have we ever seen gas falling? It doesn't expand in all directions. So they get back into this circle jerk of people asserting that they've got a force to pull the gas around the helium balloon down to make it go up with buoyancy, even though gas isn't going down, go boom, boom, and gravity isn't a force. But within that little summary, which didn't even take that long, some people will have lost interest. Or got confused. Why is it that the most simple thing is rejected? Which would be that the density of the and medium versus the density of the item with a vector yeah. is the cause. Yeah, I don't understand. It makes the most sense, but it's rejected and tossed aside. Doesn't matter. It's experimentally validated. So I couldn't care less. It's one of those things, Neil, where I know Anthony's got a, a bee in his bonnet for Bob Nodell. Me, I don't care. I, I know what I know <laughs> when it comes to stuff no, that's well, literally got an experiment attached to it. I just think, well, I don't care. The cause has been established. It's had the null invalidated. That's it. <laughs> that's the end of it. What is the... What is the, You want to believe there's something else at play? All right. Well, you can believe that as much as you like. I don't care. You believe what you like. Good for you. If you want to show it's actually the cause of something, you better get an experiment together. If you don't, I don't care. I just won't. I just won't pay any credence whatsoever. There's no need for me to pay any credence or demand that they relinquish their belief, which is all it is. But that's the point. He's not putting anything together, but he's talking. Yeah. People are allowed to talk. He can preach his belief all he likes, right? If it's got nothing to back it experimentally, you or anybody else with a brain that can choose, can choose to believe in it or believe in the validation provided by them experiment with the null and the hypothesis and the observed phenomena and the thing that was varied to prove it you've got a choice you can believe in whatever you like and talk about it and preach it all you want you don't have to listen yeah but it just opens the doors for other things like dielectric acceleration and all that nonsense does it not for me In a world of pseudoscience only, does that prevail? 
Well, they're in opposition to the general rhetoric of the normal Western world pseudoscience, so it's never going to fly with them. Well, if that topples, do you think the people who watch it topple with, hopefully, a line of thought that takes them along the path that we're describing with experimental validation? If that was the case, then we would hope that they would look at it in those terms and go, is this proven? Because I now know what proof is. That's why I keep saying we're banging on about it in every other ball busters. Because it's important that people understand what can be done to prove things. And in the case of relative density and the disequilibrium you can create, that's been proven scientifically. So in my... I just feel like being humble at this point is like a better plan. Rather than jumping down the necks of people who aren't... I don't want to say there yet because it sounds condescending... But when it is just recognition of something that's experimentally valid, it is kind of, you can't help but be condescending when you're like, well, if you don't recognise proof when you see it, I, I've got no, I can't do anything for you. <laughs> you know, go forth and preach whatever you believe in. Fine. If people believe you, then fine. That's their bad. That's on them. You're absolutely right. It's got to do with science because before I discovered this channel, I was watching videos and I was buying everything, the Michelson Morley and this and that and all of this other stuff. But until you understand, like, through this channel, I got the understanding of what science is and I can't be fooled no more. Right. You're not going to buy that Timote just because they say it will give you sciencey shiny hair. You're going to buy those tyres because they say they've been tested scientifically and give you better grip. You're not going to buy that Gatorade yeah, we... when they say science says the electrolytes will make your blood do something. <laughs> I don't know, whatever they claim with science. <laughs> Scientific studies have shown that if you replace your electrolytes with Gatorade... You can just see it. <laughs> it's the song by The Who. We won't get fooled again. Right. I don't want to say I won't get fooled again, but I hope I don't. You know? If you stick to science, you won't get fooled again. Well, at the very least, you'll be a little bit more sceptical. And, you know, there's... Descent into hyper skepticism isn't necessary because, on one level, you're a part of a society that if you if you brace against it all, you basically got no part in society anymore. Well, nobody wants to become a hermit because you recognise where there's been major deceptions. That's actually not a bad thing. Have you seen society lately? <laughs> Well, is that because the people that recognize the deception have become hermits? No, I'm saying that if you suddenly become a hyper-skeptic, everything everybody says always has to be questioned. The validity, how much proof you've got for it, and then suddenly you're into, well, unless it's been experimentally validated, I'm not going to accept anything, ever. It's like, well, not everything has a scientific standard to live up to. That's the first thing. The second thing is not all people are complete shits and will lie through their back teeth. So the the idea that you must question everything would leave you with no friends. Nobody would want to be around. I don't like being around people like that. Let's speak for myself only rather than overgeneralizing. I find those people quite tedious. And I find that they struggle to integrate with normal parts of society. Well, as much as normies I find quite comical, and you're like, have you seen society? Yeah, I recognize what it is. But to the same degree, I recognize that I am literally a part of that society and at some level i have to have a tolerance for those people and that tolerance is just going to be uh behaving in a way that is seeming as normal as they are and there's always going to be certain things that you have to kind of think i could approach this in this way or i can give it a five minutes thought and then think is there a better way of doing it i'll give you an example today i was doing a class with my daughter and they started talking about worms and what they were. Are they bugs? Are they insects? Are they ar arachnids? You know, all these different classifications. So I'm like, actually, I don't know. I'll just look it up. Now, that was after some thought, because I was about to blurt out. It's just the taxonomic classification system. It's completely arbitrary. 
but I thought I won't blurt that out. Let's just give this because that, that sort of remark might raise an eyebrow. And what are you talking about? The next thing you're into talking about Darwinian evolution and how it's bunk because it's working outside the convention of taxonomic classification. So rather than that, I picked up my phone and just looked it up. And I was like, actually, worm is like a, a self category, and there's all different categories within worm, you know, flatworm, tapeworm, and earthworm, and all the rest of these different worms. And they've all got subsets and and um, species, genres, all the rest of it. But you're like, after that, in other words, she's asking, I looked it up. I said, but it is just arbitrary. And she went, yeah. Because in other words, she got her answer. I didn't have to just say it doesn't mean anything. And in, in a normy way, it just flowed as part of the conversation. Now, I, I preface that by saying a few weeks, maybe a few months ago, there was a part of that class where it didn't actually happen. They were going to discuss discuss evolution. And I was like, oh, God, here we go. And all I'm thinking about is, oh, this is nonsense. Well, I wouldn't be polluting my kid with this, but, you know, we're in a class. That's just the way it is sometimes. I'll just have to bite my tongue. And it didn't come up. But then, like I say, a few weeks later, somebody happens to ask, what's the classification of this particular creature? You look it up, you discuss it, and then you happen to drop in that, well, it doesn't really matter, it's arbitrary. And then, if in three weeks we happen to get onto Darwinian evolution, I'll be like, yeah, but it is just arbitrary. We've given them these groups as names, and to say one's turned into the other is kind of a bit silly. <laughs> right? You know, that would be my attitude because it's already been prefaced. But, like I say, three months ago, it would have been easy when the subject of evolution came up to just blurt out, I think it's nonsense. I'm a hyper skeptic. And then none of the people in that group would ever allow me back in the group. <laughs> you know, my kid would suffer as a result. She wouldn't get that education and so on and so forth. So there's a certain amount of tolerance that you have to have for normal, normie society. Well, uh, you know, if you like in private, as much as this might sound horrible in private, you sit back and laugh at them. Beca only because you've reached that point where you cannot have the level of empathy that is required to disseminate what we know, if you want to be a bit big-headed about it, to everybody in the Western world. That's never going to happen. So, you know, unless you're delusional, some people in this community think they can disseminate this information to the entirety of the Western world. Well, OK, keep kidding yourselves until you die at 90 and say, oh, wow, of 10% of the population now. And it's like, OK, well, if that was all you were looking to hope to achieve... You know, you've, you've probably died wasting a lot of your life just worrying about the rest of society being in line with you because you've recognised something they haven't. Why exclude yourself? Don't, as, yeah, go on. don't say 90. Don't say 90? <laughs> Why, because 90 years noise. old, because I picked that age. <laughs> Nathan, Yes. are you aware of the time? Yes, I am, but I it's wanted to get to my end, end of my waffle. Thank you very much, Anthony. I've got to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might have a watch. That doesn't I, mean you're watching it. Yeah. Start the show. Yeah, don't give me stop orders. Him at nine, but <laughs> I tried to stop him at nine, but he was doing so good. Welcome to Flat Earth Debate Live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon, and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. 
If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcome back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel, so please share the show. Now we are joined by Neil, Sleeping Warrior, Righteous Force, Arwin, Eli, Tenth Man, Neil, did I miss anybody? Uh, John, a whole bunch of people in Discord, so welcome one and all. Good morning. Hello, hello. Good, hey, good morning. Good afternoon. Sky. Good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning. It is indeed. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as the curve of the Earth? No, nope, but you can think that there is. You mean you mean the thing um, that obstructs, well, on a globe, if, if we lived on a globe, the thing that would be geometrically obstructing things in the distance, like the bottoms of boats, the bottoms of mountains, the bottoms of cities? Yes, like an ant on a basketball. Right. You would need an actual obstruction, not an apparent one. Yes, the claim from Globe Earth is that there's a physical geometric sphere edge. Now, that is their horizon. They believe the horizon is Earth curve and it's a physical geometric limitation to your view, blocking boats and buildings as they go over it to be qualified with Earth curve mathematics at a rate with drop and hidden values to show how much things are hidden behind the physical geometric sphere edge horizon before it was debunked by the Black Swan. Now we don't have a geometric horizon, they will deny that the horizon's Earth curve by their own claim if they're an anti-flat Earther. Oh, the pain to be a flat Earther. A an anti-flat Earther, my bad. Anti-flat Earthers have to deny the claim that the horizon is even claimed to be Earth curve by them. Very amusing. Well, at the moment that they say it's only an apparent position, um, they've surrendered their argument. Correct. That's the essence of the black swan in its construction. The well, moment that you say the horizon's refracted, then it's no longer geometric, and your claim of Earth curve is a geometric claim. That's what I was trying to explain to my other son, my 16-year-old, who is actually being influenced by my 18-year-old, but he's just not getting it. Well, see, it's the word apparent that's tricking him. Because the geometric horizon would be apparent, right? But you're talking about what you see. So when they say it's an apparent horizon, they're saying it's not an, the actual well, horizon. I, what they're I saying. Don't, I don't think it's that he's being tricked. Um, because I, I listened to um, a debate that Jaronism had about three years ago, and pretty much. <laughs> uh, the shoe was on the other foot back then. They were saying, get out of this esoteric nonsense. Stop talking about the sky and this and that. We want direct evidence. Funny, funny that, because we usually talk about direct evidence. But the point that I'm trying to make is, um, if you showed your son, like there are countless videos of how to get the distance to the horizon. So the question then becomes, well, what? What is this based on? Well, it's based on the, the geometric consideration of a globe with a sphere. I mean, a, a, a globe with a radius of 3,959 miles. That's where the formula comes from. So it would have to be that in order for the formula to be accurately describing where the horizon would be. So once you just YouTube how to get the distance to the horizon and they understand, oh, okay, well, that is the current accepted rhetoric and then you show them how that's not true. That's as simple as I've been able to put it to people. I just said that. I just went through the whole thing with him, even with the sexton. No, no. Uh, you uh, have, you you have to show him, no, no. No, you have to show him globe earthers saying you, the very oh, opposite. Video. Yes. Now, even no, if you do that, that, no, no, just explain what, what, what then happens. It's not your sort of black and white view of at that point he must recognise that we haven't got the actual globe claim of Earth curve horizons because it's beyond the geometry. I'll just clear some curls up. Sorry, I'll clear my throat first. Hold on. So, in terms of horizons being apparent, by definition, all, without exception, all horizons are apparent. Why? Well, because you can see them. That's what apparent means. 
Yeah, appearing, apparent. Now, in this context, appearing but not actual is our context for the horizon being apparent. Their context is apparent but geometric. So all horizons are apparent, but the globe horizon is geometric. So by definition, it's the position where the land meets the sea. The land doesn't actually meet the sea. It just is the position you can see it looking like. That is to see it. So there are no non-visible horizons. We, and we only have one horizon. Now, the horizon in the begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking earth curve calculator marked with an X and labelled horizon is their geometric earth curve edge horizon. That's what they're measuring when they say that boats go over it. It's a geometric claim. Now, if you rewind three to four years, you'll have this, this following statement made by globe believers now relabeled anti-flat earthers to flat earthers which is to say we don't need to account for perspective in our globe maths because it is geometric the moment you relinquish that and say oh well apparent refracted not really in the position that it would be not the geometric horizon we never get to see it then you can never measure it you can never assert it with earth curve geometry because you've relinquished all claims of having the geometry at the horizon at that point. Bye bye, globe Earth. So at that point, they're basically just hijacking what we see perspectively, right? And it's not tied to any geometry whatsoever, basically. Not exactly. They're hijacking what we see optically and calling it, as a globe believer, geometric. Here's a picture of the horizon. Now let's look at it in our geometric, begging the question, earth curve mathematics. With a marked as an X labelled horizon obstruction to your view. Here's the geometry. So they replace the optics with geometry. And that's how they justify not having perspective. Until you say, well, we can't see the geometric horizon. It's beyond the geometric limitations of an Earth sphere radius 3959. Here's the black swan. They say, quote, we wouldn't expect to see geometry. But you have to. It's got to be physical. It has to be geometric. So they have to have their physical geometry blocking things as per their maths. The moment they say it's refracted, it's no longer geometric, no longer capable of being measured to give them an R value, no longer capable of being claimed to be physically blocking things because the horizon's no longer a physical obstruction. If it's not geometric, it's not got an R value. And that's how they get their R value from the horizon. Yeah, he was understanding that, but then he took, then he went immediately right to the thing with the sky, with the different rotations of stars, and I had to explain that to him that they yeah, all the, the, rise. In hold on, the West. hold on. Yeah, so what he did was he segued away from the devastating loss of his geometric physical sphere edge horizon, formerly known as Earth curve, to give him an R value to maybe claim it's refracted with an R value terrestrial refraction. Maybe he didn't get to the argument where he should be throwing in 7 over 6 R terrestrial refraction based on the very R he would have measured at the horizon to refract it with. No, he didn't get that far. Instead, he segued onto different rotations. It just means he doesn't know the end of the fundy anti-flat earth argument, which is to claim it's refracted. And that would be refracted with R if he was to take it to the conclusion of where they've got so far with the black swan. It's refracted. Their refraction being based on an R that's come from the horizon that's geometric. Yeah, and then uh, he just turned around and assumed that the Earth was a sphere anyway with antipodal star rotations. Yeah, that's Correct. what I said. Correct. I told so him. I said, you put yourself on a sphere. Yeah, so if you can't get around the fact you haven't got a geometric physical sphere edge for a horizon, chant that you've got antipodal star rotation on an assumed sphere you're standing on to make yourself feel a bit better. I better beg the question of it being a sphere that I'm standing on for this antipodal star rotation I'm going to beg the question of and ask you to justify because I feel really bad now I haven't got Earth Curve as a horizon. So let's change the subject quick sharp.
Yeah, it started with a commercial. I couldn't take it. The commercial had to, it was Will Smith, and it's all about the earth and geography, and it was showing a sphere. I was like, this, this is ridiculous. This has been debunked. So that's how the whole thing started. That's your problem then. This caused by you. So when I said you need to be at one with this, being yes. at one with it would involve you watching this advert, not mentioning it at all, not having it phase you, not even having a little facial tick. So if there was a body language expert in the room reading your emotion to say he doesn't care, but you do care. Get rid of the TV. Get rid of that TV. Yeah, I agree. I was, we were watching a sporting event. The Giants are on. It's I always that, expecting. isn't it? It's always this sporting. It's, it's always your foosball. I was talking to the TV. I wasn't expecting my 16-year-old to respond. I didn't get no debate. I told you. I, I've told you this already. The vibe you Ew. give off. You don't have to be talking to somebody to be giving off a general vibe of hostility towards people's belief. Now, the moment you relinquish all care, you know you've got you're a bit more apathetic towards it all. Then that will permeate throughout your family. But at the moment, okay. your hostility is going to be met with, especially in, with your boys, the same level of aggression and hostility so you're inducing this i've said this all along and i'm right nathan i sense an opportunity here uh, neil how long have you been talking to your tv i can't take it no more i can't take this damn commercial <laughs> yeah dump the tv well well i just wanted to say uh more than apathetic you kind of gotta be i don't know if the word is sympathetic or empathetic because um, it, guess what? Like, uh, imagine you are right. Imagine it hurts every time you point out something that can't be refuted. Like to, to like when my family watches things with me and they see like space or the moon or the globe, like they constantly look at me and they ask me, would you want to watch that? Or would you? And i they know that I'm cool with all of that. Like, I, I don't even bring up flat earth like that and unless they directly try to challenge, directly try to challenge me. So everything is cool. I'm not, because they don't under, they don't really, until someone actually cares and digs into it, they don't understand that they have a belief system. Or, or at least they don't want to be told that they have a belief system and that they've been lied to. That's not what every I was trying day. to tell him. He's got a belief system. And yeah. he doesn't want to, when he, when he wants to hear it or when he wants to accept it, then you can talk to him about it. Otherwise, you're just kind of, you know, push, putting maybe him off a little bit, you know? I was talking to the TV, not him. He should mind his own business. <laughs> Shout out to Mike, Mike 808 for the hit in the super chat. Really appreciate the support. Thank you very much indeed. It's my psychotic TV. Leave me alone. <laughs> this is between me. And the two. Yeah. Correct. What kind, of TV, what kind of TV do you have? It's a Zenith. Oh, a Zenith TV. Do you know about Zenith? <laughs> okay, as Nielsen segued on to axial rotation, might as well ask the question. Any evidence of axial rotation of the Earth-based variety? No. You need to assume it was a sphere first. Nope. What, like Nielsen did? Another thing I said, we have no move. They say we're moving, but we don't feel it. They say the earth curves, but we don't see it. I mean, you could have linked it back. That they... Go on, Eli. Sorry. Uh, the tactic that I saw in the three year old uh, Jaron debate um, was that they get, uh, because they're under the impression that everything that they've been told is true and legitimate and based in evidence, right? So, they they can ask you a million questions about the fairy tale that you never set out to answer in the first place. All of these begging the question fallacies, affirming the consequent fallacies, circular reasoning fallacies can all be summed up with, yeah, that's assuming that it's a globe, which is the thing that we're trying to prove. Where's the direct evidence for that? Oh, where's the direct evidence that's flat? Well, you have celestial navigation and you have the black swan. What else you want to talk about? Correct. Yeah. That's what I did. Black Swan and the Sexton. Ends it all. Well, you can link that back to his axial rotation question, because he's like, well, how do they rotate? It's like, well, how do you assume the spherical surface and the radiant value for that rotation unless you've got an R value derived from a geometric horizon we've debunked with the Black Swan? 
So, you know, if someone tries to wiggle off the hook by taking it to another claimed globe proof, this is where, um, I think it was John, to give you credit for this, you know, a, a useful exercise to go through the process of figuring out where R and the derivation of R is linked back to each of the housekeeping arguments. Because if somebody tries to, you know, scattergun, and you've started with Earth Curve, seems like the most sensible place. I think the order's pretty good that the housekeeping questions are, are laid out in. Because you start with, where's Earth Curve? And if they're an anti-flat Earth, they can deny they even claim they've got a physical horizon that's geometrically blocking stuff. We never claim that, says an anti-flat Earther. But if it's, you know, a, fun, a normal non-fundy, they'll say, well, the horizon. Then you debunk it, show them the black swan, show them how it's beyond the geometric limitations of their sphere Earth radius 3959 and how they can no longer get R if you've got a black swan scenario where you can't measure it because you haven't got any geometry to measure. You know, the horizon's moving. It's not physically blocking stuff. It's moving with the weather. So therefore, not your Earth curve edge. At that point, if they jump to a different subject, exactly as done by Brian, uh, by Brian, by Neil Sun, then you go, okay, you want to claim now that we've got antipodal star rotation? Yeah, that's based on a rotation value in radians and you being antipodal on a sphere Earth radius 3959. So for all of this assumption, you need R. Where where'd you get it? Well, you got it from the horizon, the one that you've moved on from and decided not to address. That's where you've got R to make this assumption in the first place. And you haven't got it anymore. So what are you going to do? Assume that you've antipodal without an R value to assume it with? Yeah, that's just fundy faith. Nothing more. Yo, his other thing was, I got to throw this there before you get to the next housekeeping question. He thinks it's a sign of weakness that we declare that we don't know what the sky is, what the sun is, and what the stars are. I see. Well, so let me get it straight. He's done one day. Let's just have a nice little fantasy moment. He's wandered into a hospital because he's got a sick relative and um, he tells somebody and they mistake him as he walks down the hall. Someone mistakes him for a surgeon. They put him in scrubs. They put a mask on and they come on, come on, let's get you in. He thinks he's going to see his sick relative. He's like, doesn't understand why he's in scrubs, but he is. And then he's in the operation theatre and he's like, oh, does he, A, say, it would be weak to admit that I am not a neural surgeon? <laughs> or does he start having a little poke around in this guy's head? <laughs> Which one does he do? <laughs> Is it weakness? If he's, principled, if he's principled, he would do the surgery. <laughs> oh, bad. That's bad. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah, but un unfortunately, no, no, no. That's, that's literally the world we're living in today where put in that circumstance he would feel like, oh, I need to do this because I'm right. It's that it's that egotistical nature of the world a lot of people have nowadays. It's kind of ridiculous. Instead of just being honest, like, hey, guys, uh, I'm not a surgeon. Uh, you might want to find a real surgeon. No, no, I'll just pretend. I'm not a real one, but I play one on TV. That type of shit, you know? Yeah, and the nurse turns around and says, um, says on this form you're a surgeon. Get on with it. <laughs> Yeah, but they don't know what... That's what I was trying to tell them. They don't know what's up there. They've never been there either. Well, the, the people that are debating with us or engaging with us, I wouldn't call it a debate. It's over as far as debating with us. They've lost. But the people that are engaging with us aren't professionals in this arena. And the people that are professionals won't step into this arena. That's true. Well, yeah, like who, who is it already... going to take to come out to these people, to these people who believe in the globe, to you know believe that that like show them, you know, if, if if somebody like from NASA came out and said, you know, hey, the Earth is flat, you know, are these people who believe in the globe going to believe that that one guy? Like, what is it going to take for these people who believe in the globe to believe that it's flat? You know, NASA. NASA it would take. Said... Hang, hang on, again, please. NASA already said the Earth is motionless and flat. Go on, Eli. Yeah, it would take better marketing because okay. the, that, that's the thing. Exactly what Tent just said is the problem. They've already uh, on paper admitted that everything that we, we talk about and dispute with these anti-flat earthers, they've already written somewhere that <laughs> said thing is theoretical, hypothetical, if this, then that kind of stuff. You know? It's it's yep. not based that, in any evidence whatsoever. So, and that's why the global sound the way they do, 
where they have to defend the indefendable, right? It's pretty shitty when you have to defend a, a globe when the people that you run to to tell you it's a globe tell you in their documents it's flat and stationary. <laughs> and that's how we have to assume it whenever we build vehicles, which we actually put people in that actually have to work over the actual Earth. But yep. they're not working on the not actual or level or the really is level. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But here, here, look at this globe. Look at this pretty cartoon we got for you over here. But meanwhile, in our official documents, flat and stationary all day. Funny, isn't that? It is pretty, though. So when they ask you what the sky is, right, it's because people think that they know the Earth is a globe, but they're really just enamored with the religion about what's in the sky. Because no one really talks about Earth as a globe, really. Unless it's in some rhetoric like, oh, we're taking over the globe, yada, 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 down under Australia, blah, 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 blah. But when it comes to the wonder of everything, it's outside. It's up there. All of this stuff doing this stuff. Chaos well, asked, the moment they... Hold on, just one sec. Chaos asked, what would it take to make them appreciate it? And then he gave an example if somebody from NASA came out. Well, they have in a way, because there's recently lots of disclosed documents in the last, I don't know how many years it is, um, that show NASA's descriptions of technical aspects of dealing with Earth and how it's flat and stationary. And it's there in black and white. And they're in the documents that are related to actual functioning things that take place on the surface of Earth. So they have to deal with it in that way because that's how it is. And it states it in black and white. Now, what will the anti-flat earther do when they're presented with that information? Well, they'll say, well, here's my excuse for why they said that. They'll justify it, in other words. Explain it away, or potentially hand wave it, like it never even happened. Because they're not going to relinquish their entire worldview simply because somebody... It's akin to thinking that John is our most recent addition that's technically not recently transitioned from Globe Earth, but an, an outspoken Globe proponent that was akin to any other Globe proponent that comes here in many ways. And his transition to say, well, I'm a Globe proponent, actually, I've realised I haven't got a measurement, I haven't got an hour, therefore it cannot be anything other than flat because I need a geometric horizon regardless of the shape. You know, I can only describe an aspect, not a shape, if I haven't got a geometric horizon. That's John's backstory from transition globe believer slash anti-flat earther. More girl got back in touch, by the way. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to flat earther. Now, does that mean that in that process, when he tells people like he does daily, pretty much, on the show, about how he's transitioned, why he's transitioned, how he cannot accept the globe anymore, that that's going to convert anybody? Not really. Fortunately, people are their own people you know they're not going to be told anything in most instances they can be slowly drip fed and educated into believing certain things and once they believe them they're going to stand by those beliefs regardless of what you say until there's something that is going to break them so the reason i've harped on about this for a little bit longer chaos is because your question's very interesting to me my first show after finding out earth was flat was predominantly about that all i did was interview I was going to say new flat earthers, which they were at the time, but people who are now <laughs> like the old gurus. But back then, all my interviews on Flat Earth UK, my first question to every single one of them, how did you find out? And it, it's not the exact question, but it, it alludes to what was it that made you transition like John did? For him, it was the black swan. So prior to that, there may be many fundies out there that would always just say, we can measure Earth curve, you stupid idiot. And then they go on with their day. Now, there's different uh, different strokes for different folks. Not everyone's going to see the black swan as their transitional eureka moment. It's just not for everybody. It was for John. For all the people I interviewed on Flat Earth UK, they all had different reasons. And different means of finding those reasons. And different research avenues that led them there. And different conspiracies that they've been looking at prior to it. That they got a lot of knowledge on in some instances. Some were completely fresh. But... The point is that everyone comes to it from a different way and for the most part, if not 100% of the time, the, the characteristic of the person is more 
important than what they know or don't know or what you've presented them. If they're of a characteristic that they are genuinely inquiring, then even if their dogged determination that they're on a sphere right up until a point comes, as long as they're genuinely inquiring, when that thing comes along, they won't just deny it and go into cognitive dissonance and pain and anti-flat earthism, basically. You know, that, at that point, you've got to have some internal intellectual honesty and accept what you found out. A lot of people don't do that. Because the mainstream isn't aligning with it. So I can't possibly accept that that's the case. There's got to be some reason beyond my intellect that I that can square that circle. So they go into denial. They do it with the housekeeping questions. They've been doing it for about five, four years. Well, well, they've all been debunked, have they? Let's hear them. Don't just say it to make yourself better, feel better about this scenario that you've obviously come across something that you couldn't get around. You couldn't get around it. So you've said, oh, it's all been debunked in your mind, telling yourself that someone somewhere must have done. Well, no, they haven't. Otherwise, we wouldn't still be saying them. Because we'd look stupid. Because we'd just have non-stop that video that debunked question number three on the housekeeping posted every day in the comments section. Do we get that? No, we don't. But delusional idiots will tell themselves they're all debunked because they just haven't got the intellectual honesty to say, I can't debunk this. And rather than, well, someone must have done, going, well, let's see if I can then. Let's actually try to debunk it and when they fail and the logic stands they go oh my god i'm on a flat plane not everyone's got that character so saying what's the universal silver bullet there isn't one it's dependent on the person's character as much as it is on the information they find the two have got to align to get anybody to come to this subject a, a, a realization of your reality isn't an easy thing to to comprehend when you've got a, a totally uh skewed worldview that you've known from birth it's really hard. It's hard for me. There wasn't a single person I interviewed that said it wasn't hard. And it is. It doesn't mean it's not great. But, um, the, you know what? the thing is, is um, it, at the moment that they, you have to relinquish that you measure Earth curve, at that moment, um, it, it is moral. It, it's your own morals and, and your character, like, like you said. But... Uh, when they start asking you questions about how the world works, that's a concession. I agree. When they start saying things like, uh, well, then what's the sky? You know, that that's the concession. Well, it could be any job. No, no, it's not, it's not about the question, Neil. It's about, I, I know exactly where you're coming from, John. What you're saying is, I'll give you my reply rather than summarising what you've said. My reply is, so you're in the same boat as me then. So at this stage... You're looking to me to answer your now new lack of understanding that where you had a good understanding of the sky and its vacuum-like nature and gas pressures without containers in violations of natural law was all in fine understanding. But now that it's been debunked, your response to me is, well, what is the sky then? Now, there's two reasons for that. One is so that if I present some garbage, I can pull that apart and then go away happy that, well, it must still be a vacuum. Or they genuinely want to learn. But the point is that regardless of if they're an open-minded person at that point that just recognises they don't know something and would just like to know, nothing wrong with that, versus somebody that just wants to hear a garbage explanation from a flat earther so they can pull that apart and then go about their merry way, still believing they're on a sphere even though it's been debunked with second law of thermodynamics. But those are your only two choices. And at which point I just say, well, I'd like to know too. If you find out, let me know. Did you get the gas pressure out of the container yet? Yeah, you're welcome right, to Flat Earth. The sky's not a vacuum. I don't know what the sky is. I'd love to know, though. And so would you, it seems. Because that's what right. got through. That's what I wanted to say. I was waiting for that housekeeping question. He was understanding that when we got to that. And I explained how if we lived on a sphere, and that's infinite space, then all of this air we are breathed would fill the available space, and we would not have any air. So, to me, that's still the best, because he was understanding that. Well, you don't have to put it in context of a sphere for that one, either. Uh, because even if it was a sphere, you would still need a container. Um, you, don't, you don't even have to put sphere on the beginning of that. So, you don't have to let, let him beg the question of a sphere at the beginning. Just, you know, point out the gas pressure needs containment, else gas will fill space. Correct, but I was using Nathan's way. If Earth was a sphere... 
and we had infinite space, then we'd be dead. Because where would we, where'd the air be going? It would be filling the infinite space, would it not? Right, but uh, the description of infinite space, you could probably try to wrangle that into a, a flat Earth paradigm. Doesn't mean it's true. Still need a finite space to have gas pressure. And that, like, um, damn, I wanted to make a point uh, when the point was they want you to they'll they'll say oh something is debunked when it when it actually wasn't. So one example of that is when we bring up the lunar eclipse. Is the thing is we're not making a claim. The claim about what it is is already out there. Aristotle said, hey, we know that the Earth is a sphere because look at the curved shape on the moon during a lunar eclipse. So the bottom line is the way they describe it is you have the sun, you have the earth, and you have the moon in a line, in a syzygy. And um, when the moon moves, no, yeah, into uh, alignment with the earth, it's in the earth's shadow. That's why uh, there's an eclipse. That's what they say is happening. But when you're observing the eclipse, it doesn't look like what they're describing is happening is happening. So on top of the sun and the moon both being above you, when you're looking at the lunar eclipse, you also have the fact that the so-called shadow is coming in from all sorts of directions other than the one you would expect if you if you saw the moon and you're expecting it as you're looking at it traverse the sky all night let's say the eclipse starts at 5 a.m or whatever and it's getting lower towards the horizon you would expect for it to descend into the area that's going to cause the shadow and that would begin at the bottom of the moon because it's descending into the shadow, but you see it at the top. It's in. It's like I don't. That's not an argument. That's just an observation. How could it be what you're saying it is when I'm looking at the moon, and the and the thing that I'm standing on is supposed to be causing the shadow, but the shadow is at the top. How is that possible? There's no answer for that. There's there's no debunking that. Or you just get them to show you a diagram of how they claim it is, and when they show you umbra and penumbra with convergent light from the sun, you go, really? So it converges. <laughs> That's yet to happen. One day that'll actually happen. Someone will come on the show and start describing how eclipses work after we've had a sextant argument five minutes prior and they just haven't heard or something. That's correct. Yeah, that was actually a topic, uh, what was it, last week? Because um, in the U.S., there was actually a, a partial eclipse, and I had brought it up in chat. And uh, I did, you know, like the diameter of the moon, diameter of, of the moon's shadow, uh, which was 30 times smaller than, than the actual diameter of the moon, and then um, the Earth's diameter by that 30 times, um, which the shadow of the Earth on the moon should have only been 256 miles wide. And everybody was trying to tell me that the angle of incidence from the sun to the Earth and then the umbrum wouldn't be the same like it was for the moon. And it was just a, a spouting uh, nonsense, really. Why'd you even get into that? Umbra. Right, but... Umbra, not umbrum. Umbra and penumbra. Yeah, yeah. Penumbra and umbra, whatever. <laughs> they Sorry, were John. dealing in the realm of possibilities, though, and things that they, you know, no one knows. Because then they can claim they know it. So when you talk about the sky, they can claim they know things about the sky. Because no one knows anything about the sky. And the horizon, the reason it was so important is, is what everything is built off of. Correct. So at that moment, 
they, they can't claim anything on the sky. Meanwhile, back at NASA with the technical documents, sir, it's <laughs> flat and motionless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's somebody, somebody said, well, what would you need to show them? Well, here's a few NASA documents where they declare when in operation on Earth's plane, you must consider it flat and stationary. Here it is in black and white. Like I say, all you'll get from anti... Either, if they've never come across this information ever, they go, wow, that's amazing, and just take it into consideration, probably on their way to flat Earth, or at the very least realising that they've been lied to, or they defend it. No, 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 there must be a reason why. They'd... It's just easier to consider yes. it flat. <laughs> I've heard that one a few times. That. It's easier to yep. consider it flat. Why would it be easier if you were on a sphere to consider it flat? Well, currently, uh, they don't even know what an angle is anymore because when the Sexton argument came out from all of us, uh, they say, well, yeah, it's an angle measuring device, but uh, you don't need a straight baseline. You can have a curved baseline to get that angle. Now, right there, they've conceded the whole argument. It just hasn't hit them yet. Can't have a curved adjacent, and that's it. That's the end of the argument. That is the death nail of that argument. How'd you get straight two straight lines on a curved surface you don't so it's easier to consider it flat yeah yeah it must be flat for this to work because it can't work if it's a sphere now you'd have a whole other raft of problems and a way of dealing with it wouldn't be triangulation if we were on a sphere because it wouldn't work yeah, but imagine just... imagine that's your level of argument you have to consider the Earth to be exact opposite of what you're told it is or what you experience it to be in order for things to work on it. Ma imagine that. Yeah, it's, it's like Mr. Sensible still being dishonest about trilateration and triangulation. Now, he's saying that in celestial navigation with the sextant, you're actually trilaterating. He cites nothing. He just talks as if it's true. In the meantime, we've put up documents uh, showing what trilateration is versus uh, triangulation. And trilateration is really come alive in the GPS uh, era. It's come alive with microwave signals. It's got to have a radio frequency bouncing off of something coming back to uh, the source in a straight line. Now, the sextant does not work on electronic basis whatsoever. That's why the Navy is back at it saying, hey, in the event of an EMP attack, we need to have a navigation like the old sailors did, where we just use the celestial objects. And so now the Navy's reinstituted the sextant because it's not electronic. Trilateration is electronic based. You got to have a signal bouncing off of your smartphone for them to know where you are. This guy is so dishonest, but he's got everybody who's uh, a Patreon over there supporting them thinking that he's proven the section is trilateration when it's actually triangulation. Well, they've got a layer of bullshit. We've known yep. that for a while. But ultimately, when it comes to the triangulation method, as I said earlier, it only works on a flat surface. You've got to have triangulation in place. And when they appeal to things like GPS, GPS is Cartesian anyway. It's done in a grid system. It's done on a flat plane. So when they appeal to GPS, you know, look into our GPS actually lays out what it's doing. It's Cartesian. Shout out to Brian's logic. Um, I have something that relates <clears throat> to that a little bit, uh, but it's on a, the uh, distance to the sun. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? Well, um, you know, the, they say they, uh, the not actual size of the sun as it moves through its not actual position, right? We're talking about angular size. You want me to summarize that question for you so you can pad off the back of it? Yeah, go ahead. Why does the not actual size of the sun not change in not actual size as it moves from its not actual position? Right, they're talking about angular size when they're they're talking about that, right? Yeah, that'd be angular, not actual. Angular, apparent size. Angular size is not actual size. 
So why does its not actual size change throughout the day as it moves on a globe from its not actual refracted position? Well, given the third refraction uh, is a curve, right? Where do they get the straight lines to claim that? They don't. They can't measure the angle in the first instance. Not only can they not measure an angle because they don't have a straight line for the adjacent and their horizon is dipping away from them 8 inches per mile squared to form an obstruction. Not only do they not have a curved adjacent, when they describe it after the fact when you've measured it with an angle on a flat plane to get a straight line to form a vortex to actually measure the angle, they'll then take that angle out of your hand that you've measured it with and say that that angle's actually at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. Again, ignoring the fact that you wouldn't have been able to measure the angle and that you're not standing at the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. That's what they'll do. Wow. Yeah, so the claim of... Uh, their claim about the sun and its uh, apparent size is complete garbage. Yeah, they can't measure its apparent size without two straight lines. I don't even know what another, it is. Another, it's another diversionary tactic question. Just like, oh, why do we have a uh, uh, pressure gradient when asked about gas pressure in the first place? It's nonsense. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without the necessary antecedent of a container to press upon? No. Yeah, that's two ridiculous. containers. No, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, slower. it's never been demonstrated. Two containers. Any evidence that you can have gas pressure without a container? No, it's never been demonstrated. Can't have gas pressure. I was waiting for Arwin contained. to say three containers, actually, Neil. Sorry. Well, I still like my mathematical formula that if you have a set pressure in a canister, um, which when relieved into a pipe will equal a gradient pressure on the other side, right? Then you have a container on both sides. You can just take that container out at that point and just talk about the gradient. I see. So imagine that you've got a containerless container because you've arbitrarily assigned, say, two lots of one meter squared area or one meter cubed area and then you just say well that's the amount of pressure we're talking about in that amount of area and obviously that arbitrarily assigned area that i've given doesn't need any containment and it's still got the pressure there just ignore the prerequisite to have a container to achieve the pressure to make your example and just start with an existence in an arbitrary amount of space that you assign it right you know, Nathan, I wish I was a glober for once because I just dropped over a grand on four Michelin containers for my truck because I needed air pressure. Oh, I wish I was a glober with fire in my mouth. No. What about when they say, how come the air is thinner in Mount Everest? Because it is. It went up. You just say it stops there. No. But it definitely made its way up there. Up. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Well, you, you can't describe it as mass. One is attracted to mass two if you throw out your measurements for M2. And you can't say that space-time is bending around M1 if you throw out your measurements of M1. So I don't know if there's a description for gravity anymore. No, there isn't. It's a big problem if you've got a fundamentalist religious belief in 107-year-out-of-date mass-attracting mass or the curvature of space-time in a pseudo-fourth space dimension that we don't exist in. It's a very real problem. Obviously, the concept that's being described with maths in that instance, 107-year-out-of-date mass-attracting mass or bending pseudo-fourth space, that would be Einsteinian gravity, either one of them don't actually have a phenomena to describe. So, yeah, you're throwing out mass moving to the centre of M2 in the first one, at a date though it is. But I just said 30 seconds earlier that, you know, the air's made its way up to the top of Everest. It's definitely not moving to the centre of Earth. That's not what gas does. You're going to need a glob for that. 
what for gas to move away from it while simultaneously being claimed to move down 9.8 meters per second per second because it's got mass when it isn't doing that I, I don't need to appeal to any of the pseudo force space being debunked in the mathematics and not having a phenomenon to describe when the thing that they do describe literally doesn't happen yeah but everything we say you're going to need a globe for that for the claim yeah you're going to need a claim a, a globe to claim that you've got mass moving towards mass at 9.8 meters per second per second or any other rate with any other cause describable if you say it's bending space time that causes that causes that well that that causing that thing isn't a thing it's not happening so to try and figure out why and assert why you've got a cause of something that happens when it doesn't happen seems a bit silly. Well, isn't Neil deGrasse Tyson with that uh, beach ball in the shape of a globe, when he says what he says, um, he's basically doing the opposite because he's saying we don't have a globe. It's flat. And so now these guys are saying, you know, to everything, well, you're going to need a globe for that. Well, go to your high priest. He's saying that... There's no way of knowing you're on the globe even when you're really high up, let alone when you're on the ground like an ant. So how did you ever get this belief in the first place? He doesn't explicitly say it's about how it would be on a globe. He always has some comparison. In that case, a beach ball. And he's saying you won't see the curve of the Earth from three millimetres above this beach ball. He even goes to the extent of slapping the beach ball like it's booty. <laughs> you can't see the curve of the earth one you're three millimeters above this beach ball so he's making you reify it he doesn't explicitly say so i'm sure you could find an example where he does but i can't think of one it's always done in 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 a metaphor or in a, a simile or whatever it's called and left to you to reify it for yourself well he did it with gravity when he says i don't know well the horizon oh, can I say all that something Hi, guys. When okay, he well. says that about the beach ball, he never actually shows you what it looks like three millimeters above that beach ball. If you have a really small camera, like a tube camera or something, yeah, what does it look like? I bet you could see it three millimeters from the beach ball, actually, in reality. Yeah, but see what? That's his best magic trick, because all we're doing now is discussing what we would see. Well, what we would see from above the beach ball is a physical geometric limitation based on the radius of the ball and its limitation based on the physicality. That would be the ball's horizon presented to the ant three millimeters above it. So it's the horizon. That's what it is. So when you say, I bet you could see it at three millimeters above, what the now reified horizon from the ball to the position of your view of a horizon because that's the point of the trick make sure everyone still reifies the horizon into a geometric physical limitation like this ant's going to see on an actual ball hello adam well that's the whole point isn't it it yeah. is on an actual ball visible right so he's claiming it's not visible on a ball yes it is it exactly would be. exactly we wouldn't see it on our ball isn't overtly stated it's not visible to bend. We're not going to see the bend if we're three millimetres above the beach ball, if you're an ant, is the claim. Well, whether or not you see it bending is irrelevant when you're reifying that actual geometric limitation on an actual ball for an ant to our horizon we see in our reality. The two are not the same. One has got geometry. The one that we see, that's our horizons, not Earth curve. doesn't have geometry. And the anti-flat Earths tell, our, tell us how we wouldn't expect to see earth curve <laughs> we wouldn't expect to see geometry it's not as simple as that yeah it is unfortunately for them well at some point if he stuck a yardstick on it the two ends would stick out in space what if you put a ruler on it on that beach ball long enough ruler the ends would stick out in space uh, thus uh uh, see, th this is a sphere, but as far as we can tell, it's flat. Well, uh, put a ruler on it. What happens when you put a ruler on it? And how high do you have to be for that? When all along in schooling from kindergarten up, you're showing me a globe and telling me there's curvature and bombs and boats are being blocked by it. So now you're telling me that's not true? Yeah. Meanwhile, we do not have a geometric horizon to block boats and buildings. We're being told how non-geometric it is and how it's an outrage that we should expect to see 
physical earth curve geometry at the horizon. <laughs> yeah, we don't expect to see that. The globe does, you anti-flat earthers out there who are now denying it. Would, would it help to call it obstruction, right? Like, so the ant two millimeters above the beach ball would have a geometric obstruction at a, a set distance, you know? What, like asserted in earth curve geometry, where they assert that the horizon's going to form a physical geometric obstruction to boats and buildings that they can quantify with its hidden value. That sort of obstruction, you mean? Yeah, so the ant would experience a geometric obstruction. You don't experience that geometric obstruction on Earth. Correct. So, in other words, the black swan works as a double whammy because not only is it the case that the horizon you're claiming is geometric if you believe you're on a sphere is beyond its limitations, if it's beyond its limitations, then you haven't got the geometry you must have on a sphere. And you haven't got it anymore. Like the beach ball with the ant, the ant is and must always have a limitation to its view at the horizon of the beach ball. It's a must-have if you're on a ball. It's not going to go away. Well, that's the geometry that you can assert of that ball with its ball horizon. Geometric limitation for the ant. Our horizon doesn't offer those qualities, and I'm afraid it doesn't offer any geometry to measure. It's not Earth curve, and we're being told by the anti-flat earthers how non-Earth curvy that horizon is at the moment. So, yeah, it's kind of game over. Well, it's, it's, it's better than that. When he slapped that beach ball and said what he said, he just threw Eratosthenes under the bus, because according to Eratosthenes, the shadow caused by the sun was because Earth was curving away in Alexandria from Cyan at 7.2 degrees. So he threw, it was a, he, he threw Galileo under the bus as well when he apparently used the first telescope and he observed boats disappearing bottom first. He, he threw him under the bus as well. Not yeah. only that, he sucked all the flat Earthers into it too. You see, you see, even Neil deGrasse is saying Earth is flat. But he isn't. He's saying you can't see the curve of the Earth from two millimeters above this beach ball. Well, that, as a statement, pretty reasonable. No, Mr. Tyson, you're right. I can't see the curve of the Earth from two millimetres above a beach ball. Number one, there is no Earth curve to see because our horizon isn't Earth curve. We've only got one horizon, and the horizon in your begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking Earth curve calculator is geometric, like the horizon for your ant on that there beach ball. But that's not our horizon. What's that you say? You're slapping it and telling us it's flat? That's fascinating. We know. But to be on a ball, you've got to have a geometric horizon, and you haven't. Meanwhile, back at NASA, the documents say we are on a flat, motionless Earth. <laughs> what, what he's saying there, just to pick Neil up and to agree with Nathan, he's not saying that um, you're living on a flat Earth. He's, what he's saying is the Earth's not I a sphere, that. but you can think of it as a sphere. That's what he's saying. Yeah, he is. I no, know what it... that. You see what I'm saying? But flat earthers get tricked into it. That's why I always said it's his greatest trick because he's got both people back on a sphere. Well, both, both sides reifying the horizon into a physical earth curve edge and then arguing about whether or not it should or shouldn't bend at a certain altitude. The horizon doesn't bend at an altitude of whatever the globe says, says the flat earther, is the hope of that argument from Tyson. He hopes that, no, we won't see it bend, will be what the Flat Earther says. And it then is only taken upon them because he says that stuff is flat. So they take it as part of their argument, not realising that saying it won't bend, well, it's back to calling it, that's the horizon assumed to be geometric earth curve edge obstruction, won't bend at a certain altitude. Yeah, yeah doesn't matter whether or not it bends, it's not earth curve. We're not right. supposed to That's see exactly. the geometric horizon. Right, like, so if you go up 300,000 miles and it seems like the horizon bends, it's still not Earth curve, guys. So at that point, your pictures are done, too. Yeah, and if they show you a flat horizon at the same altitude and you go as a flat earther, look, the horizon's not bending... It's like, well, you've missed the correct part of this argument that's the strongest. Yeah? In other words, who cares what the horizon is? Why are you pointing out that it's not bending? It's not a physical location to do anything. It's an apparent position where the sky looks like it's meeting the ground. Something that doesn't ever happen. Curved, not curved, who cares? It's not Earth curve.
Did I mention that there's a couple of people on the hook from DITRH that have said they want Bitcoin? And they've been given the link to come to discuss it here, but none of them have actually made an appearance yet. Two of what them. What about the Morgyle? You said something about the Morgyle earlier. Earlier. Yeah, he got back in touch. He's had a broken computer, so he sent me an email saying bump, and I didn't know what he meant. I think he just meant keeping the email up the chain so he doesn't get forgotten about. But uh, I didn't actually read the email. I just read the first line of it this morning when I woke up. Well, it's the effect of my computer's been broken. Dot, 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 dot. I was like, okay, fine. I'll come to that later. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll read the email and then presumably start sending him emails again with the link in and hopefully he'll join one of the days and have a chat with us. That'd be nice. But yeah, back to what I actually said, which is that there's a couple of people lined up that have um, met the prerequisite to get Bitcoin out of David if they can prove the Earth's a sphere. So they've, you know, I don't know what the stipulations are. You've got to download the app. I know that's one of the stipulations. And then you've got to watch stuff for a week or something like that. There's a few things you've got to do. At which point it's like, right, okay, now go and present your evidence to the guys over on Flat Earth Debate. Let's see how it stacks up. See if it holds. If it doesn't, obviously no Bitcoin for you. But as I said, they, they know where to go. They're apparently both reasonably unfamiliar with Discord. But they've got Discord names that I've been given, and I've not I've not seen them yet. If they have any sense, though, they're watching this show or your shows and trying to formulate arguments. You know what I mean? Studying their enemy is what. Yeah, that's what I did. That's exactly what I did before I uh, was going to present evidence. But the Black Swan kind of ruined all that. Or you could just. Or you could just come in like virus and then after getting your head chopped off, say, you see how I'm attacking your argument? <laughs> the, the bigger question is, why isn't anyone on the panel going after that Bitcoin? What to prove? You've got to prove a sphere with... How am I going to prove a sphere to get Bitcoin? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I got a Bitcoin address if you want it, but, you know, there's no that doesn't come with glow proof seeds, so sorry. Yeah, no, yeah I should have really mentioned that. that. You, you get the I Bitcoin for... Bitcoin address. You get the Bitcoin for proving Earth's a sphere. So they've well, got to come here point. and prove it's a sphere. That's it. That's what they've got to do. That's my point. Uh, the incentive is high. The payoff is great. And here we are saying, come on, somebody, come and prove it. But it, wouldn't we do it if we could prove it? Wouldn't we go after that Bitcoin? Hell yeah. That's the first thing I said to him. I was like, I wish I could chase after it. <laughs> but, you know, alas, <laughs> I know it's fruitless. What's the point? But yeah, I'd chase after it. If if I actually that's, thought that's, Earth was a sphere, I'd want two hundred grand or whatever it is. Especially right now, Bitcoin is on a nice dip. Two hundred grand? Why oh, wouldn't shoot. you want that? I'm going to prove it right now. Two hundred grand? With that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you first and foremost to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's live show possible. If you are watching this on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams, then stay tuned as there will be an after show to follow. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I'll see you all in the next video. I don't know what to tell you about that. It sounds crazy. What happened? Did you say you had ethereal? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, let's <laughs> let's have the Bitcoin talk. Come on, be reasonable. What do you mean? That, I thought that was the. Uh... That, that's what the stakes. That's what the stakes All are. Right. If, now, there's right? A, if there's a if there's a twenty thousand pound English pound prize fund for something, that doesn't mean that you suddenly discuss the whys and wherefores of currency exchange just because there's a prize pot put up. The currency is irrelevant. You know, the amount is almost irrelevant. This is very uh, similar to the the British Empire putting up a lot of money for someone to solve the longitude issue 
And John Harrison came up with a chronometer, so he got it. it. Took many, many years because you had to make a timepiece that could be accurate in the ocean with the boat moving around. And prior to that, they had pendulums, and obviously that wouldn't work. So the gears and everything else. So now we've got something very similar. Uh, Someone's offering Bitcoin. If you can prove there it's a sphere, uh, let's see what happens. Who would be? Let's. That's. This is an interesting question. Who would be gutted if someone came along and they proved it? They offered up a, a logical consistency that you couldn't get around, and they showed you demonstrable evidence of sphericity. Who here would would be upset about that? Demonstrable. Then I that's reality. Upset. I'd be all right with that. <laughs> if that's me reality. too. That makes two. That's me and chocolate. Yeah. Anybody else? Any, uh, uh, the phone knows who yes. I would well, be really cool. shocked because I'd then everything it. I took for granted would turn out to be wrong. Right. Okay. Humility from Arwin. What was that? Um, who was that in Discord? Let's just show it up. Ugh, tabs, yeah. Tabs. I, I said, yeah, I'd appreciate Ram. it. I think it'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So everyone's in agreement. If it if they well, could show it was a sphere, for, we'd right? be we'd be quite pleased. We'd be like, great. See, but then then that would take yeah, me I would. to having uh, opinions about what my senses have been telling me my entire life. Um, that would be a slight problem for me. But other than that, if it was demonstrable, I'd be like, shit. Well, there you go. <laughs> sure. I would but be tickled to death. It's not. I would be tickled to death. I, I'd be like. Uh, calling people up and saying, you know what I told you about? I'll just forget all that. Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to sleep. It's exactly. Go back into norminess and not really care anymore. You know, I'd pick a different show subject, probably start making videos about computers or audio or something. But, you know, until the Western world changes their view, I see this as having longevity. And, you know, all we're really doing is saying, prove... Prove yourself right with your extraordinary globe claim. Well, when did Neil deGrasse Tyson have to come back and redo that video with the beach ball and say, well, you know what? The Earth does have a radius of 3959 and curvature can be spotted at this uh, measurement rather than what I said earlier. So discount everything I said about the ant. Yeah, he would if there wasn't a need for the claim to actually just stand as it is there wouldn't be an andrew thomas young claim that you can refract the geometry with an r that's been derived from the geometry you know andrew thomas young's explanation for the for the average anti-flat earther wouldn't exist well he's con uh, like people confuse the two different kinds the two different kinds of curve in that description you know the x-axis curvature to the y-axis curvature right in the earth curve mathematics it's two-dimensional you know you're it's from your position to the horizon and what he's talking about when he slaps that beach ball is uh looking at, at the horizon and it's being apparently horizontal that's correct you know? that's correct he's, he's he's steering well clear of the actual rhetoric that is claimed to prove we're on a sphere with an earth curve edge horizon that you can see how much is blocking things and moves that into the realm that they do have measurements for it's in the advanced section of the same calculator i relabel begging the question proof of nothing perspective hijacking curve calculator the advanced tab will take you through the horizontal upside down smiley face that we're describing when you look out but you can't even visually show that in their mathematics you know, it's a it's a side on view, so you've got a single point for a horizon in that geometry, so you don't have a side left to right curving horizon. So, in other words, Neil deGrasse Tyson's steering completely away from the actual mathematical claim, shockingly, and just talking about something that's colloquially described and not mathematically de defined very often as the left to right bend of an Earth curve edge horizon in your view. How much does it bend? Well, according to Neil deGrasse Tyson, not very much at high altitude. You wouldn't even see it even if you're an ant. But it's like, well, that's not how it's qualified, though. For you fundies who actually think you're on a globe and argue with us, you don't qualify how much it does or doesn't bend at altitude. You tell us how much it does or doesn't block stuff. Well, you know, Nathan, it, we're going to... Uh, yeah, go on, no. John. I'll, I'll go after you. Sorry. I was going to say, it does do a lot to confuse the argument, though, you know, because then... Uh, flat earther is thinking that he, you know, he's saying earth curve, 
and what they're thinking of in the, the earth curve calculator and saying, see, he's saying it's flat, but then the ball earthers saying, no, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about a different axis, right? Yeah, yeah. you so know what's funny? He almost, he almost puts a disclaimer at the end of it, like almost like it's a distraction because right after that whole little spiel, he's, he ends that with saying, you know, there's so much out in the universe to be to be uh, uh, one wild by, I'm paraphrasing, obviously. There's so much out there to be, you know, wild by that I don't want you to, you know what, let me go get the quote, because it's, it's interesting, because he says, there's so much in the universe that you could be impressed by, that's the word he used, impressed, that I don't want you to, be distracted by the things that are not, right? After taking away this curvature, supposedly, that he's talking about. That's what he tells the audience, that there's so much to be impressed by that this thing that I just spoke about, this curvature, that's not impressive. So don't be distracted by that. I find that very funny when, when he says that. Right, you know, uh, well, you, you just don't understand. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to take us. I'd like to take us back to who else would be uh, surprised if, if it ever happened is the American Association of Geographers. Here's fictitious geography. In science and also in mapping, we are concerned with nonfiction generally in our work. But all too often, we lose sight of the fact that much of our nonfiction is built upon abstraction and arbitrarily agreed upon convention, like p-values, for instance. With that in mind, today I will share some words from the glossary to help to us remember that right there in our nonfiction research is our own fiction that we like to call abstraction and assumption. And at the end, and going through all these different words, then at the end summary says, we should embrace the fiction in our science because understanding what we can measure and what we can not is a very important step to understanding the world around us scientifically. I, be I agree with that. Hold on. I agree so with do that. I, because you can't measure it. Right, but I, I no, don't. you can measure it flat. Yes, <laughs> I know. I meant the globe you can't measure. See, but you see how they use that? It's another okie doke I just heard. Like, what are you talking about measuring? But they're talking about science, not measuring anything. Establishing cause and effect. And how are you embracing the fiction in your science? That means accepting the bullshit? That's what I hear. <laughs> Except with fancy words. What are you, what are you trying to No, fool? no, no. Chocolate, you don't get it. It's about not deleting the emails about science fiction. That's what it's about. <laughs> while, you, while you're listening to iTunes? Right. Well, well, they hear observe a phenomenon and they think give mathematical description and you're done. You know? Like, mathematically describe that phenomenon and you finished. You, you start sending emails and listening to that's iTunes. That's not science, though. No, it's not, but that's what they think. Well, even Andrew Thomas Young would admit that the geometric horizon isn't anything anyone could measure. It's a thought experiment. What we can gather, hey, everybody, hey, Nathan, what we can mm -hmm. gather from all these people is everyone who goes out and does any observations without thinking about whether it's a flat earth or a globe end up knowing they can't prove it's a globe. <laughs> Andrew Thomas Young, surveyors, you name it. You know, I'm sure Neil deGrasse Tyson looked as well. You can't prove this thing. Where's the coverage off? I, I don't know. So you think they willfully, they know it's flat, but they're just in the lie and staying in the lie? Well, no. I, th I think that maybe they just know they can't find this coverage off. But they have to keep on, if they want to keep believing it's a globe, then they have to say, well, there's other ways to tell that it's a globe. You know what I mean? I don't know how that, you know, the, the stars and whatever else. You know, they, they, if they want to keep that belief going, they'll come up with something in their own mind. But when it comes to actually measuring it, it never happens. Has anybody well, sent Neil deGrasse Tyson any of our housekeeping questions? We should send him all uh, our housekeeping questions and see. Maybe he'll why? turn. Why do you care? We can use him as a hostile witness, right? In terms of your desire to convert Neil deGrasse Tyson, while I'm, I, I'm simultaneously telling you, you know, just chill with it, don't worry about it, don't bring it up and give off the bad vibes for your son. Meanwhile, you want to chase down Tyson. 
<laughs> I always want to see you debate Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's a dream of mine. Don't don't destroy my dream. Hold on a second. Tyson would be too cowardly to come here. He's got too much to lose. He'd be yeah. too scared. So yeah. then they're woefully staying in it, like I said before. They're woefully staying in the lie. They know it's flat. Someone with I don't think that. No. Someone, someone with more charisma than him with his uh, show gig, dropping mics and dancing, it might dance better and have a better tie. Well, see, the, the difference between a glober and an anti-flat earther is, is a glober thinks you can measure earth curve. An anti-flat earther realizes you can't. Maybe. But still wants to assume it, it's curving. Because you'll never find a glober that says, oh, you can't measure the earth. It's too late for that. They've already given us a radius of 39.59. Now it's just geometry. Yeah. I right. thought they thought they measured that, though. Oh, you... They thought they measured that, though, too. Yeah, yeah. No, so so on, with the... you, know, you can measure the curve. We're going right? to use that, though, right, John? Just now, optically. <laughs> well, back to John. John, they thought they measured it, but we're going to use it. Uh, so what's that measurement going to show us from the surface? Flat or curved? Well, see, so you kind of you begging the question that we measure it flat, like you know what I mean. Like it's well, no, that uh, question well, kind of malformed. Sorry, just to, just to interrupt. Is... Sorry, tenth. So to speak to your point though, you're saying when it when it comes to them denying the measurement not being able to be attained to be an anti flat earther. Well, I think there's probably a lot of truth in that because if they're here, they can recognise how they can't measure it because we're telling them, and then they justify it. So they have to say, well, we wouldn't expect to be able to see physical geometry. You know, some half assed justification for the very thing that's being claimed by the globe. Now, if you want to progress that from there, the only choice you have is to try and force the anti-flat earther to accept their original globe claim. So it's like, wh why would you want to put someone up against a wall and say, I'm going to now force you to accept your original claim that you've moved away from to justify the debunking. It's like, let them justify the debunking because they're no longer defending the original claim. If the original claim is earth curve obstruction at the horizon, blocking boats and buildings, and then someone says, we wouldn't expect to see physical geometry, you go, what? I'm going to now put you up against the wall and go, you must accept the earth curve is physical geometry. Why? The person is then moved away from the claim, at which point John is right. They accept that they cannot actually prove their religious faith and they defend it anyway. Well, it's nothing but pain, as far as I can tell, from the people we deal with. They all seem to be in a lot of pain. That's just facts. I started my email. Deal near the grass, Tyson. Any evidence of earth curve? <laughs> Question one. No, tell them there's 200 grand. Oh, Baldwin just gave you the answer there a moment ago. Do you want to repeat it, Baldwin? No, no, I slipped it in there just fine with nobody picking up on it. No, he needs you to do it. That's right. Well done, Baldwin. He needs you to summarise it, Brian. So if he has any part of the summary that's then debunked, it becomes your claim because you've given it us in summary, making it your claim that you're going to make for him now if you take this bait. <laughs> and I will. Um, well spotted, uh, though, by the way. Yeah, I, I couldn't get in there soon enough. Uh, yeah, uh, we do measure our curve, just not optically. I heard him. <laughs> Question number two, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Any evidence you could have gas pressure out of container? Please respond. Columns of air moving in lockstep with the rotation. Be dropping in the full questions if you were actually writing this. In other words, if you're asking for Earth curve, you'd have to say any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as Earth curve. I don't just say that for humorous effect. It's said that way because of the disclaimers that are required. If you just say any evidence of Earth curve to Neil deGrasse Tyson, he'll send you back a nice picture of the horizon. What are you going to do then? Write back and go, no. What I actually meant was, have you got any evidence of the horizon given that the physical geometric sphere edge you think this horizon represents has been debunked by this claim whereas if you just ask out off the cuff what's your evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as earth curve it's a loaded question so if he then comes back with the horizon no what part of physical geometric sphere edge didn't you understand <laughs> you know are you stupid that's not a physical geometric sphere edge limitation to block boats and buildings idiot okay repeat that again <laughs> I'm not writing your letter to Tyson. Just listen to how I phrase the questions <laughs> each day. 
A word curve. Uh, that's a lot of words. Any evidence of a physical geometric sphere edge horizon formerly known as Earth formerly curve. Known as Earth curves. Got it. He's dead. If you want to have any chance of getting him here, the best thing to do is be uh, is to play uh, a little bit of a game and say, um, I have three Bitcoin uh, and I need you to shut these flat earthers up. They're causing a muck and play on his pride if you're going to try it. But it still ain't going to work. No, I was thinking more like play the gullible, like... I, 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 I'm believing Earth is a sphere, but I'm starting to believe flat Earth is. Can you help me, Neil deGrasse? And throw these questions at him. He'll just dismiss it. Yeah, because I'm not a star. He, he needs Perry, to think no, at the door. No, Neil, no. He would just tell you, why are you hanging around with flat Earthers? We warned you about it. Don't engage. He did warn you about it, Neil. There's a whole, there's a whole list of um, arguments you could make, although in that same uh, list, uh, well, the place where they, the, I guess the article, they also say, <laughs> don't engage whatsoever. But if you do, here's a list of things you can bring up. <laughs> that with the horizon, right? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's like I say, when you're in conversation with an anti-flat earther and they're denying their own claim of physical geometry at the horizon. In other words, all horizons are apparent, Fundy. Your horizon's geometric. No, no, we wouldn't expect to see geometry. And then you present them with citations like that. Why is it that in literally the step-by-step -step guide for idiots who don't know how to debate what you should do if you encounter a flat earther, why does it suggest to them that the first thing you should reference is the horizon? And the horizon's got a little X next to it in this geometric mass that shows it as a physical obstruction. You're going to qualify with how many feet and inches are missing. Why would that be the case? Because at this point, Mr. Anti-Flat Earther, you're denying the very premise of the claim in the first instance when you tell me we wouldn't expect to see geometry or nobody claims the horizon's Earth curve, as we have literally been told. Question number three, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Any viable hypothesis for any of the fields of astronomy, astrology, or astrophysics? Did I get that right? Astronomy, cosmology, or astrophysics? Astronomy. Cosmology, okay. Astronomy. Astronomy, cosmology, and astrophysics. He would probably just quote Michio Kaku when you do that. By the seat of our pants. <laughs> right, nobody... And uses the scientific method. Oh, and stop bringing me down! Yeah, he'll probably make a, a lighthearted quip about it. Like, he'll probably mention that and say, well, you know, people kind of always take this out of context because there's a lot of, of obviously uh, hardworking people who put a lot of time into um, understanding our universe. And then he'll probably start talking about, I don't know, all, all types of uh, complicated math that has nothing to do with nothing. What they need to do is develop a, a maybe an institute that could bring anti-flat earthers back into the fold of globe belief, you know? No, Angus. no, that's no, that's not what they want. They want the anti-flat earthers to have their whole list of scattergunning fallacies to preoccupy us because they know they can never eventually end up technically winning this argument. Right. This, so this part... they want busying therapy. They want people to be preoccupied. They want anti-flat earthers out there that make the wrong assertions, which they can look down upon as they are keeping their actual opponent busy. That's right. exactly what they want. The balanced equation has been achieved in this part of the internet. There is the flat earthers going against the globe faith and the anti-flat earthers keeping the flat earthers busy with anti-flat earth rhetoric that has nothing to do with the claims of the globe. So you have flat earthers kept busy debunking anti-flat earth claims, if they're not careful, and not focused on the original claims made by the globe. 
That's why I piss the globe believers off so much here. Because that's all I do. You know, you want to segue onto some nonsense that you know about, right? Okay, we won't allow that. We just focus on what's originally been claimed. The extraordinary claim of a globe. And whether or not you can actually prove it. That's what we focus on here. Now, if you've got an anti-flat earther in the mix and he's debating with a flat earther, then all things are balanced and equal because the rest of society is kept away from this part of the internet. So it's just the hustle and tussle between flat earthers and anti-flat earthers. And then they're not arguing with normie globers who are giving them the normie globe arguments to defeat. They're having to defeat the anti-flat earth non-rhetoric based arguments that the people in the same exact corner separated away from society, one side in pain, and in many instances, the newbies who come to Flat Earth think that they're going to spend the rest of their life in pain away from society. And in reality, it's not necessarily the case on one side of this argument in this little corner of the internet. You don't have to be in pain if you're on the Flat Earth side of the argument. Recognising reality doesn't cause any pain. Denying the recognition of your reality in favour of a belief that's been debunked, that definitely causes pain. Well, those people... They're the dark side of this little corner of the internet. We're the light side. Now, those two yin and yangs that have been balanced out beautifully now, after a few years, like I say, they don't have to have that have any part to do with the society they want. That can be kept poisoned with all sorts of other mediums. And this particular part of this particular medium just gets kept, just gets kept away from them. Well, that doesn't well, mean that the people we deal with aren't in perpetual pain, because they are. They're just stuck right. in hell with us. Yeah, and Microsoft. when put if I can number say, four, can I, the grass tasted. Any can I continue of, with the train of thought, Neil? And a presuppose spherical earth. Yeah, can I continue the thought, right? So they like the anti flat earthers doing that because then when push comes to shove, they can literally disclaim association. It's like, no, these anti-flat earth, or they won't call them anti-flat earth, yeah, but these people that are trying to defend the globe, they're just really confused. But that's what happens when you're dealing with flat earthers. You get all switched up. So they lose track, even though they're doing their best, right? That way they never actually have to address their own technical arguments and create this comfortable, reasonable barrier between the flat earthers and themselves. Exactly. They're not claiming rhetoric-based arguments when they tell us that we've got a refracted non-geometric horizon based on an R-based refraction that you couldn't get R in the first place for. None of that makes any sense. Yeah, When the actual claim is, yeah, of course you can see Earth curve, it's the horizon. And when the anti-flat earthers argue with us and explain their convoluted get-around for our debunking of a claim that you've got a physical horizon, that's nothing to do with the rhetoric of a globe. So if it was presented as such, it's like, well, that's not the rhetoric of the globe. No, no, the rhetoric of the globe absolutely is that you've got earth curve edge obstructions getting in the way of things, and that is the horizon. Because at that point, it's being spoken of by someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson, who has definitely got no bridges between us and him. So therefore, he's not going to get challenged when he makes the actual globe claim to a willing audience that's definitely there to agree with him. Well, back to my original point, though, when you send exactly. soldiers Department out, when I, sent, when I sent, when I, if I was a country and I sent out soldiers to protect my borders and they were hurt or received some kind of mental distress, PTSD, maybe you, you would expect some kind of treatment facility for that individual when they come home. Um, the anti-flat earthers are never going to get that. Nope. That's very well put. That's correct. They're never going to receive sympathy or praise or adulation from anyone who's still a normie. None of that's ever going to come their way. Perpetual pain and the same um, uh, abandonment from the society that they will, at a conscious level, recognise is lying to them. And they're having to defend it. Well, th that's not going to get praise. It's not going to get thanks. If anything, it'll get you told how wrong you are by the actual priests. Because they don't say what you say. You say what you say as a result of what we say. Hence John's assertion that you need us. Because you're only bracing against us and in fact the globe. And because you're bracing against the globe when you give us anti-flat earth rhetoric. Definitely not globe rhetoric. What's that? Earth and atmosphere spinning as one? No Coriolis to observe. That's definitely not a globe claim. But that nonsense, should it be ever pulled apart by the actual priests, wouldn't be aligned with. They'd be telling you how wrong you are, because you are. 
and you're wrong because you've had to get around the fact that we've debunked what the priest says. But at that point, we're not standing in front of the priest, are we? You're just getting told off for how wrong you are for putting across your anti-flat earth rhetoric to get around how the priest has told you earth turns underneath 15 degrees now deviation is the result don't you understand because what are you going to do at that point tell the priest well no because an anti-flat uh, i'm sorry a flat earther would say we don't see the effect you're not going to fight our argument when the priest slapping your wrists and telling you you should just understand that earth does turn underneath when you're describing coriolis you're going to put the flat earth argument to that priest no you're going to sit there in silence and grit your teeth and feel your pain especially when somebody says it on mainstream tv this is the thing, you forget these normies are completely 100% plugged into the Matrix. So when they're watching their normie dose of TV, and Neil says it really bugs me when they talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, the flat earth, I keep mixing these two up. The anti-flat earth has experienced the same thing. When they understand and appreciate that we haven't got an earth curve edge for a horizon asserted with geometry, and then normie mainstream priest puts out a piece of information into the propaganda networks that says that it absolutely is a physical geometric limitation to their view. Here's a helicopter going behind that physical limitation. They're sitting there thinking, hmm, no, if they understood the complexities of this argument, they'd understand that we don't see the actual geometry of it. In other words, it'll make them shift uncomfortably in their seats when the mainstream rhetoric comes on, that is actually the globe claim that they deny to us. Because they're spending their time debating with us, telling us how nobody claims the horizon's Earth curve. Nobody's expecting to see physical geometry. We wouldn't expect to see a geometric horizon. Those are all quotes. That's going to be painful right. when they see someone on the priest side of the argument uh -huh. telling them that they should. The anti-flat earthers are like globe priest separatists. They think they know better. And they don't realize how preposterous the entire setup is that, like, no, it's just not a globe. It's not like, oh, the mainstream got it wrong and you got it right. No, it's ridiculous to still believe it's real after that realization moment, but they still do. And they hang on to it and they make themselves separatist priests. Right. So we're anti-establishment in this regard. And the establishment needs some useful idiots to fight the anti-establishment. Because if they fight with us, if the establishment, that would be Neil deGrasse Tyson in this example, fights with us, then his arguments get debunked. Well, you can't have the priesthood arguing with people that can debunk their arguments, and he's overtly stated that. I wouldn't want to, when he reverses the actual reality of the situation and says that he wouldn't want to be made to look like he didn't understand exactly how the world was by somebody with a bit more charisma than him, when in reality he's got no actual data and only charisma to sell his worldview and belief with. But that's what he will tell you. He's not going to engage with us because that isn't how it needs to be. He needs anti-flat earthers as useful idiots to oppose us. Because otherwise we'd be directly opposing NASA because there'd be nobody else, no one knocking on our doors. All right. Well, eventually all the people who come here on the Discord side of the server and say, I'm, you know, baying for blood. I want to go out and rip these people a new one because I'm doing it in the servers. It's like, well, yeah, that's what happens. Those kind of people need busying. Well, Nathan, get the useful Nathan idiots to five. do it. Nathan, hang on now. Neil, I've sent you the list. All right, uh, Nathan, the anti-flat earthers is a cottage industry. They only exist because they got to keep a buffer between us and the Globers. Now, they, they, uh, they were an invention of absolute, how can I put it? Uh, the Globers had nowhere to go. And there were a few people within the Globers who say, you know what, we're getting killed because the, the flat earthers are using our own material against us and we got nothing. So they were invented. The anti-flat earthers exist because they need a buffer between us and the Globers because we use, like, for example, Mr. Sensible, we're using everything uh, about the sextant and about all of the things that we talk about from the globe side. They can't have that because it disproves the globe when they're questioned and the way we look at it, we ask the right questions. So they say, we need a buffer. Let's become anti-flat earthers and keep them from the globe and let them be, have attention on us. So they must be the most miserable people on earth because when they turn on the TV, it goes against what they say. When they come against us, we use the globe rhetoric and it goes against what they say. They're just a lonely, depressed group of people. Well I disagree, to with help that. Them I disagree with that. Anti flat earthers are a grassroots movement, really. They naturally arrived. It was counted upon them to naturally arrive. It's not been a creation 
from top down from the official priesthood, it's a naturally arriving effect in people to do that, to start doing that. Did I say it wasn't natural? Anyway, while we establish whether or not anti-flat earthers are a natural phenomenon, I'm going to say another huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Premiering Streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, and all that good stuff. Also, below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. And this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. I've been Nathan Oakley, and I will see you all in the next video.